Joel chapter 1. All right, so let's jump right in to chapter 1, where locusts are going to devastate the land of Judah. We'll just jump into the first four verses. Verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. So the prophet Joel spoke to the southern kingdom of Judah without making reference to the northern kingdom of Israel. It's hard to know this exact time because Joel doesn't mention any other kings or prophets. And so a lot of scholars will date the book to about 835 BC. And this makes Joel a pre-exile prophet who served before the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel in 721 BC and the southern kingdom of Judah in 586 BC. Other pre-exile prophets include Obadiah, Jonah, Hosea, Amos, Isaiah, and Micah. Joel is one of these earliest prophets. Only Obadiah prophesied before his time in 845 BC. And so 835 BC was a time of turmoil and transition in Judah. At the end of the reign of Queen Mother Athaliah and the beginning of the reign of King Joash, Athaliah seized power at the sudden death in battle of her son Ahaziah, who reigned only one year in 2 Kings chapter 8 and 2 Kings chapter 11 verse 1. Athaliah killed all her son's heirs except for one who was hidden in the temple and escaped, the one-year-old Joash in 2 Kings 11 verse 3. Her six-year reign of terror finally ended in 835 BC when the high priest Jehoiada overthrew Athaliah and set the seven-year-old Joash on the throne in 2 Kings 11 verses 4 through 21. So during her six years as queen over Judah, Athaliah reigned wickedly. She was the granddaughter of an ungodly King Omri of Israel, making her daughter or niece to Ahab, one of Israel's worst kings in 2 Kings chapter 8. Uh, Athaliah raised her son Ahaziah to reign in the wicked pattern of Ahab and even brought in Ahab's counselors to advise him in 2 Chronicles 22, verses 2-4. through 4. And when Ahaziah was killed in battle, uh, Athaliah seized power and set her other sons to do evil, even desecrating the temple and its sacred things in 2 Chronicles 24, verse 7. So if we're accurate in thinking that Joel prophesied in 835 BC, then the judgment he described came towards the end of a six-year reign of ungodliness under Queen Athaliah. No wonder God brought a heavy hand on Judah. And so the name Joel means Jehovah's God, and therefore constitutes a short confession of faith, uh, kind of like a primary New Testament confession, Jesus is Lord. And so Joel here in these first passages was not announcing a coming judgment of the Lord. He's describing their present state, devastated by successive swarms of locusts, First chewing, then swarming, then crawling and consuming. Uh, so Judah is going to experience a time of famine and financial ruin because of these locusts. And uh, the plague is unusual that Joel says, you know, tell your children about it. The times were so remarkably difficult that parents would tell their children, I lived through the plagues of locusts. And so, <clears throat> verses 5 through 7, an army of locusts against Judah. Verse 5, awake you drunkards and weep, and wail all you drinkers of wine. Because of the new wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth, for a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the fangs of a fierce lion. He has laid waste my vine, and he has ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made white. So Joel tells the drunkards to wake up and see the devastation the locusts caused. They came like a mighty nation, a fierce army against Judah. And God looks at the vines and fig trees of Judah and says they belong to him, even in judgment. Verses 8-12, through 12, Judah mourns because of the locust destruction. Verse 8, Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off from the house of the Lord. The priest mourn who minister to the Lord. The field is wasted. The land mourns, for the grain is ruined. The new wine is dried up, the oil fails. Be ashamed, you farmers, wail, you vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley. 
because the harvest of the field has perished the vine is dried up and the fig tree has withered the pomegranate tree the palm tree also and the apple tree all the trees of the field are withered surely joy has withered away from the sons of men so joel told judah that they should look at their condition and mourn with all the emotion and passion of a young widow they should not receive this plague of locusts stoically uh, with false bravado um, so in this joel is not minimizing the suffering at all all right and so in these vivid and poetic images joel shows how the whole nation mourns this great destruction brought by locusts and it's remarkable to see that these sacrifices to the lord at the temple only stopped when there was no more grain or wine to give to god Queen Athalia's reign was wicked, but she allowed the temple ceremonies to continue. This shows us that the devil doesn't mind ceremonies in themselves, and that the devil is more interested in corrupting true religion than eliminating it. All right, verse 13 and 14, a call to repentance. Verse 13, Gird yourselves and lament, you priests, well, you who minister before the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, you who minister to my God. For the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast, call it a sacred assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. So Joel called the religious leaders to lead the nation into repentance. He told the priests to gird yourselves for repentance. Uh, the idea being prepared your, you know, to do the work of repentance. And he's going to tell them how to do this work of repentance. Consecrate a fast, right? Getting right with God. Uh, make that so important that even eating isn't important to you. Call a sacred employee or call a sacred assembly. Uh, call for God's people to come together and repent. Gather the elders. The leaders of the people should make a special point to be a part of this work of repentance. Into the house of the Lord your God, right? Come to the place where you should meet together with God and cry out to the Lord, right? Finally, simply just cry out to God and trust that he will respond in mercy. So when there was grain and wine to bring the people of Judah, still brought offerings to the, to the temple, either out of tradition or godly obedience. Now that there is no produce, there is no offering for the house of your God. Verse 15 through 20, the day of the Lord against Judah in drought. Verse 15, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. It's not the food cut off before our eyes. Joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seed shrivels under the clods. Storehouses are in shambles. Barns are broken down, for the grain has withered. How the animals groan. The herds of cattle are restless, because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep suffer punishment. O Lord, to you I cry out, for fire has devoured the open pastures, and a flame has burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field also cry out to you, for the water brooks are dried up, and fire has devoured the open pastures. So the idea behind the phrase, the day of the Lord, is that it's God's time. Man has his day, and the Lord has his day. And so in the ultimate sense, the day of the Lord is fulfilled when Jesus judges the earth and returns in glory. In a, le in a lesser sense, it's a time of judgment as Judah experienced with the locusts and drought is also an example on a smaller uh, scale of the day of the Lord. So Joel vividly describes a devastating drought. It affected everything in Judah, and wildfires are ravaging the dry land. And in this time of a drought, all Judah's just going to, all they could do was cry out to God. They were powerless to fix the drought problem. God sent them to a place where only heaven could help them, so they would look no other place. In Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, Jesus was confronted with the problem of a disaster that killed 18 people. Instead of acting like as if it was just an accident of blind fate, Jesus used it as a wake-up call for repentance. Jesus showed that, you know, why did this disaster happen to them is the wrong question. The right question is, am I ready to face such a disaster in this fallen world?